We're going to be talking a little bit about security. I know everybody's favorite subject. Um, so I don't want you to be concerned. I'm starting low, uh, but as we progress through the conversation, I have a tendency to get excitable. Um, not because you're engaging with me, just because I get excited. And uh, my hands start flaming, my tone starts going up, and it might be a little bit of a it might feel exhausting to you, and it will be just as exhausting for me, so I apologize up front. Um, my name is Tony. I work for... Um, so, my name is Tony, and I represent a company called uh, Security. Has anybody in here heard of Security? <laughs> A few folks, cool. Um, so for those that don't know, we are a website security company. Uh, who you're seeing up there is my partner, Daniel. We started this company back in 2010. Uh, I detected a few website incidents, uh, infections, and then uh, working to clean them up. We've evolved since then. We've been around for a few years. Uh, we're relatively uh, well known in the uh, website open source community, uh, not just Drupal, but WordPress, Joomla. And this is actually our first talk at an actual Drupal event. What I'm gonna be sharing with you guys is kind of our insights uh, of our network, uh, what we do, uh, the websites we infect, what we see in terms of uh, website infections and website attacks, and things that I think might be of some value to you. So with that, this talk is gonna be for a number of folks. Maybe you've been infected before, maybe you're suffering an infection now, maybe you're a system integrator. Maybe you're a business owner that's responsible for deploying a site within your infrastructure. You could be a consumer, you could be a large enterprise, it really doesn't matter. We look at websites, you know, independent of who you belong to or what industry, because they're just exactly the same. We work with small blogs, we work with large Fortune 500 organizations, it doesn't really make a difference to us. For us, it works the same. And when you look at the data, you see that there's about a billion websites out there, at least based on what W3 Tech says. And a lot of people don't necessarily go with those stats, but they're just the most reliable, at least for us. Uh, just to kind of get a better understanding of what's happening. Of that, 33% of that is made up by open source CMSs, specifically based on these platforms. And these platforms make up about 73% of that 33%. So this is where kind of Drupal fits, at least in, in this world. 2.2 of those uh, websites is coming from Drupal specifically, uh, and 4.9 of that market share of CMSs is from Drupal. What this doesn't show, however, is Drupal's adoption in types of industries, right? So you see WordPress expansion, user adoption, but you see uh, Drupal's expansion in terms of type of organization and complexity of sites and enterprises, right? It's very, very standard, very common. We're all aware of Drupal 8, landed in November, right? Uh, came out with a number of great improvements from a security standpoint. HTML, the way it's managing HTML in the front with Twig, the way it's handling XX, XSS up front by default. Um, a lot of security by default, uh, which is what came out of Drupal 8. Everybody's really excited about that. Came out in 2015. This is where things get a little bit interesting, however. When you look at the data, and you look at where things fit over the past, since its release, you get a real sense for how folks are migrating from the old versions of Drupal to the new version of Drupal. So we implemented all these awesome things, yet folks are not deploying it, they're not migrating. In fact, we're only at about 6% user adoption for Drupal 8. What that means is a lot of people are still on the older versions of Drupal. And from our analysis, we've identified that close to 81% of the infections that come through from Drupal-specific instances are it's at, at about 81%. I think perhaps one of the most uh, interesting things for the Drupal community, and just open source in general, was uh, the Panama Papers uh, uh, compromise recently. Anybody familiar with that? Uh, are you familiar with what the discussion that people were having? There was speculation around WordPress and Drupal and the potential contribution to that compromise. It's very speculative, but what it does provide is really good insight into what the reality is out there, right? So you had um, Mosek Fonseca out there with uh, a number of instances, or one instance of Drupal for their client portal and one instance of WordPress. WordPress is about three months behind, but their Drupal instance was years behind. And in that, they found 25 unique vulnerabilities to include the SQL injection vulnerability that led to an RCE um, back from 2014, okay? And I think why I bring this up is in the conversations I've been having over the past uh, couple days since I've been here, I, I know that the Drupal community is very much about technical aptitude. It was built for the developers, right? It was built for the design, uh, not so much the designers, but more for the just technically inclined individuals. And we're very, very proud of that. And so when we talk about things like backwards compatibility, we're like, well, that's not really us, right? We're worried about going to the enterprise and pushing this stuff. The problem is, 
we have to think about the audience and the users and the people deploying this. The consumers, if they have no backwards compatibility, they will never upgrade. That is a fact. The enterprises, they may want to upgrade. Their compliance tells them that they have to upgrade, but their change control processes don't allow them to. So what good does it do us as a community if we make backwards compatibility and upgrading that much harder? Okay. Just something to think about. Like I said, from the data that we have, we have about 400,000 websites that we manage and handle incidents for in our environment. We do about 500 infections a day. Um, of those, Drupal is a big piece of them. And of the ones that we analyze, 81% of them are running vulnerable pieces of code coming from the Drupal ecosystem, whether it's from core or whether it's from the modules. Patching vulnerability management is very, very tiring. It's very toxic. It doesn't matter the type of organization you are, whether you're a small business or whether you're an enterprise. Everybody's trying to figure out how to do this. They have vulnerabilities being ex um, disclosed on a continuous basis and people are not unable to prioritize what's that vulnerability, let alone prioritize what their patching sequence is. And we have to remember that Drupal is but part of a much larger ecosystem, regardless of your type of organization. The larger you are, the more complex the process is. Most people can't even keep up with their own infrastructure and the challenges that they have from a security standpoint. Things like, uh, the, uh, you know, um, I'm drawing a blank, I apologize, but a number of the vulnerabilities that have come out with like SSL and open SSL and, and Linux-based issues and server and network-based issues. Now you drew Drupal into the mix, and the one thing that I get on a continuous basis from the various knocks and socks that I'm working with is, how am I supposed to keep up with what's going on in that space? You come to this community and you say, hey, but we have security advisories. We notify people on Twitter, we send out emails, we're, we're listing it, we tell you exactly what to do and how to patch it. But the people responsible for it, the knocks and the socks, are like, that's not my domain. I don't work in that space. How am I supposed to keep up with it? How am I supposed to apply that in my environment? There was an interesting study done recently uh, that was just released last month um, on the enterprises specifically and, and the impacts that open source is having on that. They found that 33% uh, have no process for identifying or tracking or remediating open source vulnerabilities. Now this is all open source. Now think to yourself, where does Drupal fit into this space? Open source is a big thing that all enterprises are dealing with. So just imagine, this number, I would imagine, goes up even higher when we're talking about um, enterprises. 47% of them don't even know what open source technologies they're using. Because it's not always that people are making the decisions at the strategic level for deployment of something like Drupal or any other CMS application. It's someone at the functional unit, right? I need to build a complex user portal, and I'm going to use this, and I'm not going to go through IT or I may go through somebody that I know that might get me up and running quickly, or I might go to a third-party hosting service that will get, allow me to get it up quicker. But then once the compromise happens and the brand is affected, then it comes back to the brand, and it's like, what do we do now? How do we roll that back internally? 50% of them have no one responsible for open source. On the consumer side, these numbers are dramatically higher. And regardless of where you fit, more so on the consumer side, I have a feeling that we're suffering a lot from uh, security fatigue. Right? Every day we're hearing more and more. And it's not just about the platforms, we're hearing more and more in general about the everyday technologies we use, right? the devices we have. So how do we make that easier? How do we make it easier for the users of our platform to better understand the challenges that we're suffering or we're facing, and how do we convey that? Right? Through awareness, education, and things like this. So I provide that just to provide some context on, on what we're working with. And now what I want to do is kind of dive a little bit deeper into um, various facets of security, at least the way I look at the world when it comes to security and website security specifically. Um, first and foremost, it's a complex environment. And I think if you're a devel developer, you understand this. Um, but business owners don't necessarily do, right? The application you're deploying is but one piece of a much larger environment. And that environment extends not just from the infrastructure and the environment in which that application sits, but also you, right? Being here on this public Wi-Fi, right? We have public Wi-Fi, we share the same username and password. Well, I guess what? I can intercept most traffic that's intercepted going over this network. And I'm not saying this is bad, I'm saying it's fine, right? But as an integrator, we start thinking about things like HTTPS and encryption and point to point, right? To ensure that any critical information being passed, logging into our environment are safe. But we have to be thinking of our online experiences as well. We're here, what do we do? We check our mobile devices. 
We check, uh, we have Joy devices, we have iOS devices, we have our, our laptops, we're on social media, we're sharing links continuously. This environment is ripe for click jacking, intercepting communications, attacking things on your browsers, right? Cross-site request forgery attempts, through cross-site request, um, cross-site scripting attempts, right? It's, it, it just makes it that much easier because there's so much information, everybody's just clicking things. So we have to be cognizant of that as users, even as developers. I work with developers all the time. They're like, oh yeah, I, I built the greatest stuff, but they, they have the most insafe practices for their own online experiences, <laughs> right? I was like, oh, awesome, they opened the computer, no password. That's amazing, you know? Um, so we're, we're part of a much larger ecosystem. That's one thing I want to highlight. Um, and this is what I'm talking about, right? So on the environmental side, we have things like our devices. Uh, you know, we have the networks and the end users themselves. It's not just about uh, you personally, but it's about the people that are going to be using it, right? The authors, the, the, the administrators, the people logging into, the people that are going to be taking control of that application once it goes live at some point. Uh, the application itself. Remember that in most instances, even like the Panama Papers, what did you have? You had a Drupal instance for the client portal and a WordPress instance for the website. So we're not just talking about security specifically to the application that we're responsible for in deploying, we're talking about security about the entire ecosystem in which, it's, which, in which it sits. You have things like the server itself. A lot of folks don't necessarily manage that. If you're an enterprise, you might have your own infrastructure, you might have your own NOC. If you're a consumer, maybe you're using someone like Pantheon or SiteGround to manage it for you, and so they're responsible for that. But how often are we having the conversation that extends beyond the application? How often are we saying, hey, what do you do for me from a security standpoint? A lot of people will, will be surprised to find out that not much. A lot of hosts are responsible for their network, ensuring that their perimeter is safe, ensuring that you don't compromise any other applications in their environment. But if you have one account with multiple sites and multiple deployments, that's your responsibility as an end user. You could have multiple cross-site contamination histories occur within the same environment, within the same bucket. Then the infrastructure itself. A lot of people won't necessarily get into that, but it's always good to have a good conversation on that. What this does, though, is it creates a security chain in which everything's united. And in security, in security, these security chains are very common, right? Any weak link in this chain potentially creates a problem for you um, as a website owner. So if you have imp, you know, poor usage on the environmental side, you do silly things in your laptop, maybe you spend the nights doing God knows what, having a good time, uh, and then you have a bunch of malware and stuff in your local environment, and then boom, stealing your credentials, and then they're gonna gain access. Right? And this is important, right? Now that we understand that, I'm gonna go into attacks. And I always break attacks into two very distinct forms. Targeted and opportunistic. About 99% of the attacks we see are opportunistic attacks, right? Oh, hey, they're using a version of this module that's susceptible to some remote code execution. Cool. It's not a matter of I targeted that individual, they just happen to be on the web. Why wouldn't I target it? Or maybe you're in an environment that's like a soup kitchen and you have every platform under the sun and there's a vulnerability in one of those other platforms. And so that environment gets compromised via that and you just happen to be there. We see this time and time again. The larger of an organization you are, that changes. If there's enough motivation, enough incentive for me as an attacker, I'll target you all day. I'll see what you've got. There's a bigger return for me to compromise your environment. But with the attacks of opportunity, I get mass exposure. I set up automation and I attack. With that, we get into our flow and how that works. The first thing to understand about flow is automation. Almost all the attacks we see have some automated component to it. Even if it's a targeted attack, there's some automation to it. Opportunistic, absolutely. That's the only way they do it via scale. And automation allows them uh, to set, set it and forget it. If I know that I'm looking for a specific string, I can uh, configure a script to just crawl the web and identify any potential sites that have that. It reports back of the issue. I then initiate my exploit attempt. and says, okay, perfect. I've identified what the problem is. Let me attack that. Which actually talks into how it happens. So you have a phase of reconnaissance, regardless of what you're working with, you have a phase of reconnaissance. And reconnaissance is trying to identify what am I working with? If, if it's targeted, I'm looking at an organization and I'm saying, okay, um, where are their servers? What firewalls do they have? What applications are they using? Maybe it's too complicated. Maybe instead I'm gonna target it via some kind of phishing war and I'm gonna get into the environment that way because I know that all their users go online somehow. Maybe they're going to an event like this and so I'll, I'll target this environment. Then we get into identification phase. 
when it comes to opportunistic attacks, reconnaissance and identification kind of occur at the same time. I'm attacking what I already know. I know that I'm looking for a specific module, or maybe I'm looking for um, that SQL injection vulnerability in Drupal from a few uh, years ago, and I'm saying, hey, anybody that's running this version, I'm gonna go ahead and attack. I don't really care who it is. <coughs> On the targeted side, the identification identif occurs individually. So hey, this is what the environment looks like. This is what they have. I like this vulnerability. I'm gonna attack this vulnerability. Then the actual exploitation happens. When I've identified what I want, I'm gonna exploit that. Then the one thing a lot of folks don't think about is the sustainment. Once I've penetrated the environment, it's about how do I ensure I can get back in this environment once they clean me up? Things like back doors. So this happens, this, one of the, this is one of the leading causes or, or issues for reinfections. People clean up the infection, they remove the spam, they remove the malware, whatever the case may be happening, and then they get reinfected again. They don't understand, I, what, like, what happened? I don't get it. The actual compromise. A lot of people think about uh, credit card information, personal identifiable information. Those are the easy things to think about. Data exfiltration, stealing information like panel by papers. But it's not just about that. Think about NBC back in 2012. NBC, for about two hours, was hacked. And they were serving up drive-by downloads and phishing and spam. In those two hours, they affected millions of users. Millions of users. Now think about the brands that you represent, potentially, and the impacts that that has. Maybe you work for a federal organization. What does that do to that federal organization as a brand? Think about when the CIA was hacked recently, maybe about two years ago, and they were defaced. Granted, the CIA, I have high hopes that their website was not on their network. It was likely on some shared account, whatever, no problem. But from a branding perspective, they were affected. They're like, oh, even the CIA can't control their environment. They got hacked. It's so, it's so stupid. But still, most of the community will, will say, no, yeah, they, that must be an issue. They must, must not have the security. Granted, they're a government agency. They're not a for-profit organization, so they're like, Whatever, you guys are idiots. But think about the organizations you represent that do depend on um, profitability or selling products or goods. And then cleanup. I don't see this as much on the um, automated side or the opportunistic side, but I see this more on the targeted side, which is I want to make sure I don't get detected. I'm going to do as much cleanup as I possibly can to ensure that I don't get detected. So maybe I'll go through the logs, I'll clean, up, I'll, I'll clean up after myself, I'll remove any traces that show that I might have been in that environment. I'll even go in and I'll modify the file dates to ensure that you don't see when that occurred. So the file dates look exactly like when the installation occurred. Here are a couple ways that I like people to uh, think about it. So on the reconnaissance side, you're looking at scanning a specific environment, uh, scanning the web for a specific issue, right? Uh, you see here on the identification stage, it kind of occurs at the same time as opportunistic, which is 99% of the time, that's what's going on. Uh, and then you're identifying potential attack vectors. Exploitation, exploitation, specific weaknesses, and then it kind of just flows along the same way. On the cleanup, I don't see as much on the opportunistic side. It's more on the targeted, but it does happen. You can automate that process of cleaning up access logs and error logs to ensure that they don't see that. So a couple ways to think about it and controls to be thinking about. So on the reconnaissance side, how are you reducing that attack surface? How are you ensuring that they don't know what versions of stuff you're using? Or how are you ensuring that you don't have unnecessary ports and services running on that server? A lot of folks forget about this. They don't think about functional isolation. They think about just my website. They put it on a web server that's running everything else under the sun, and they leave all the ports available. Oh yeah, I can't attack that server. Oh look, port 25 is open. Let me attack that. There's a vulnerability on that. How do you even know that vulnerabilities exist? Right? Large organizations are familiar with concepts like vulnerability management programs and processes. They're familiar with that. They have teams dedicated to that. But now think of your customers. Do they? Do they have the resources for that? Are they familiar with the tools available to do that kind of stuff to identify not only known issues, but unknown issues? How do they identify unknown unknowns? How do they go through that process? What are you employing to avoid the exploitation? We all know that security is not 100%. That's a given. Anybody that tells you that it is, is wrong, right? It's all about enough time and enough motivation. So what are we doing? What technologies are we employing to address that? On the sustainment side, how do you know you have no back doors? It's not as simple as just looking for basic you know, evals you know, or, or, or obfuscation. Most of the back doors we find aren't obfuscated. Most of them are written really well, and in fact, you can borrow some of their code. It's written so well. You're like, my goodness. On the compromise side, 
I cannot tell you the number of organizations that I talk to that say, hey, so how many websites do you have? Yeah, about that. I don't know. That's what they say, I, I have no idea. I have no idea what's in my network. The only time they find out that they have an issue is when something like NBC happens, they get compromised, everybody's sharing something, and then of course, everybody's pissed off at security. <coughs> you guys failed. I'm like, well, you didn't even tell me you deployed it, right? There's no asset management, no asset inventory. Well, there is, but websites just aren't part of that. And then the cleanup side. Most organizations, at least large organizations, have some kind of incident response protocols or systems in place. But do your customers have that? Do they even understand what that means or what the process looks like? And what I'm hoping is what you take from this is I'm trying to give you information that can help you, if you're a developer, to go back and communicate to your customers and have better dialogue with them on the things that they should be considering from a security standpoint. If you're a business owner, these are questions you should be asking your developers. Hey, how am I addressing these things? And by breaking out the different phases, I have found that to be the most effective. I have found that, that most people can understand that and say, wow, you know, let me focus on that. Because if there's one thing I always tell my team, right, we can't eat a sandwich without chewing. And we can't address the entire sandwich at the same time. So we break it up into pieces. Start off on the reconnaissance side. Hey, okay, do I, do I feel comfortable there? Have I implemented whatever controls I need to there? If I have, cool, let me move into the next phase. Right, when I was in the Marine Corps, whenever we go on humps, we'd always look down. And we'd always never look up. We'd always look down to the person in front of us and we would just march. It didn't matter how far we were going, we would just march that way. Why? Because if I had to think about looking at the top of that freaking hill and say, I gotta go up to that freaking thing, there'd be no way. I'd beat myself mentally. Too many times in security, we get consumed by all the different things. Even this conversation might feel very overwhelming. But the goal is to break it into small, manageable pieces from which you can execute. When you look back six months, 12 months, what you'll realize is that your overall security posture is much, much better, but you did it in small pieces. The other thing I wanna talk about is availability. Um, one of the things we're seeing on a continuous basis is an increase in attacks against the availability. So in this instance, my intent isn't necessarily to penetrate your environment, to penetrate your perimeter. I don't care about distributing malware. What I care the most about is ensuring that your site isn't available, that it's down. And we're seeing a lot of blackmailing attempts against organizations of all sizes, saying, hey, I'm gonna do what's called a distributed denial of service on your environment. And I'm gonna attack you to the point where your resources are exhausted. Once they're exhausted, I will continue to do that for hours until you pay me a fine. You know who just suffered a very uh, severe case of this? Linode. Linode went through this for about five, four or five days, something like that. Now think, put yourself in the shoes, in their shoes as a business owner. Linode is a pretty big organization, right? How would that affect you? Maybe if you're smaller, the effect isn't that great. But if you're larger, it might be different. If you're doing commerce, it might be greater. Imagine four days of no revenue. Maybe if you're a federal government, you're like, thank goodness, I don't have to go to work today. I don't know, right? <laughs> I was a defense contractor for many years, so I can say that. <laughs> um, so now I wanna talk about, uh, so we, we kind of went over that phase. I wanna kind of talk about uh, attack vectors now, right? How we should think about that. And that, at least the ones that I feel to be uh, the most important are the things that, I, that I'm seeing on a continuous basis. Uh, so, of course, we have access control, right? Who here wouldn't think of access control? Username, passwords, silly stuff like that. We, we hear that conversation all the time. Uh, we have things like software vulnerabilities. Again, something that we would all think about. Um, what we don't necessarily always talk about, though, is things like cross-site contamination or third-party integrations and then hosting, but hosting in a different sense, and I'll get into that. So on the access control side, one of the biggest things that I like to emphasize here is that it's not just about the application. Again, it seems to be the, the did I open that door? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so uh, it's not just about the application, right? As the integrators, we say, yeah, you know, maybe our Drupal instance is the most important thing in the world. Unfortunately, in case nobody told you, it's not, right? But the username and passwords, yeah, it's very important. But then also think about all access control. How do you get into that server? How do you get into your DNS? Shit. Do you use a universal tag manager for Google or some other third party service? How do you get into that? Every one of those are potential entry points into your environment. Vulnerabilities. 
very, very standard stuff, right? We're talking about things like cross-site scripting, perhaps one of the leading vulnerabilities in Drupal core itself, right? That's what we talk about a lot, XSS, XXS. But remember, there's different types, right? When we're talking reflective, ah, you're kind of hacking yourself, you see that in phishing lures, things like that. The ones to keep an eye out for are things like stored XSS, the ones where I can penetrate your environment and ensure that anybody that visits that page will continuously get hit by that. I don't have to do any malformations of the URL, I don't have to embed that, I don't have to hide it, I don't have to send it out. Stored XSS are the ones you're most interested in. Those are actually the most severe ones in terms of XSS world, right? But you have things like SQL injection. The ability to inject something into the database and manipulate or pull the information or use that to leapfrog into the environment itself to some kind of remote code execution or whatever the case may be. You have things like CSERP or cross-site request forgery facilitated through things like cross-site scripting, right? How are we addressing that? How do we know the things that we don't know? Okay, yeah, maybe there's a, maybe there's a security advisor and we patch it and we deploy it. Maybe we know there's a security advisory, we really, really want to patch it, but our organization doesn't allow us to patch it because it has to go through change control. It has to go to user acceptance, that has to go through a process, then it has to get deployed, and that might take three months. And in some instances, I used to be a defense contractor, we would build an application for 12 months, it would take us six months to go through the approval to deploy it, another six months to go live. By the time it goes live, the technology is already three years old. Think about that. Cross-examination. Maybe you do everything under the sun and Drupal is as secure it gets. You cannot bounce a nickel off that, right? But what about the rest of the environment? What about that dev box or that dev site you left on that nobody maintains? But it's still live because everybody just forgot about it. Or that WordPress instance in that environment or that Jubilee instance in that environment. Cross-site contamination is one of the leading things of infections. And what happens is people don't think about cross-site contamination. They say, I don't understand how I got infected. Or they clean up the infected and they continue to get reinfected continuously, like I was mentioning before. And what's happening is just that neighboring environment, that lateral movement. Lateral movement is not a new concept. Lateral movement happens in perimeters all the time. We penetrate the, the, the perimeter, we get into the environment, and then we figure out where we can go from there. What other services happen? Why? Because in security, we always have this mindset of, hey, I just need to keep them out. Everything inside my perimeter is safe. Now reduce that scope to your web server, to your web application. We're doing the same thing. Oh, if I just keep them out of the website, just what I'm looking right here, I'm good. I'm not looking laterally. I'm not looking what's coming over from here and what's coming over from here. We need to be thinking about that. Third party integration is an interesting thing. Um, who can tell me a website right now that doesn't leverage some form of third party integration? Whether that's a, a library, whether that's an API for some service, whether that's ads. I see ads all the time. And they introduce something called malvertising. And malvertising is the ability to attack the ad network, <clears throat> penetrate your environment without you even knowing it. I'm compromising your website without compromising your website because I just attacked the ad network. And every website that uses this ad network, I will now rotate my malware through their ads. I will embed it in their payload, I will make it highly conditional, and it might show up once a year. It might show up once a month. It might only show up if you're coming in from Africa. It might only show up if you're using Windows XP. Shit, it might only show up when I feel like it. Very, very difficult. And it drives people mad. But you know who doesn't care when it shows up? <coughs> things like Google, things like Bing, things like Yandex, or other AVs. And guess what happens when they blacklist you? People can no longer access it. Maybe organizations use websites as their firewall. that will get categorized as potentially malicious, and nobody in that network can now access that site. Happens all the time. On the hosting side, things are a little bit different, right? Um, on the hosting side, it's not necessarily about uh, the, the large host these days. It's no longer circa 2010, 2011, right, where we saw mass compromises, where hosts were just misconfiguring the environment and the attackers were able to get in and they would just uh, attack everybody. Um, what we see a lot of is the issues on the host come from the hosts that aren't really hosts, right? The hosts that are uh, an ancillary service to an agency where they say, hey, I do your SEO, your marketing, Psh, by the way, I'm a host, right? I picked up an AWS instance, I'm deploying it, I'll just deploy your application in this environment. I, have, I know absolutely diddly squat about system administration and security, but I tell you what, you pay me those hard dollars and I'm gonna take care of your environment. You pay them and they come back and they're like, shit, what do I do now? Then they get hacked and they're like, shit, what do I do now? And you as a website owner, you're like, I don't understand, you offered me all these services, it says on your website you do this 
awesome ISO certified container stuff. And you're like, yeah, I pulled it off that website. Right? That's the issue we have on the hosting side. Motivations. I like talking about motivations because I think they're very important, um, obviously. They, they help us understand the psychology of the attackers. Why do they do what they do, right? Uh, and so I break it into four distinct categories, right? Uh, there's a revenue piece, an audience piece, uh, resources piece, and then just because I'm bored, right? Um, on the revenue side, that's pretty apparent, right? The opportunity to make money. I'm lazy as shit. I don't want to do anything else, and it's just easier for me to sit here and attack your website and make money off it. Pharma hacks alone, it's a multi-million dollar business. Pharma hacks, they abuse the way the affiliate schemes work for pharmaceuticals, and they can make anywhere between 20 to 40 million a year through pharma hacks by injecting little Viagras, Cialis, erectile dysfunction sites on your site. Just the clicks and the impressions that they get, that's how they're getting paid. Very, very lucrative. That doesn't even talk to drive-by downloads. Drive-by downloads are things like um, uh, drive-by downloads are things like fake AVs, right? Think of non-technical people. Think of people using Windows XP, and you're like, oh, the heart. Who would use that, <laughs> right? I bet you a lot of your customers do, not because they want to, because they haven't been able to upgrade. Remember what I talked about earlier about inability to upgrade environments? There's some environments, there's some system, critical infrastructure systems that still use Windows XP because they have to. Think of the Marine Corps, for the love of Christ, we're always at the bottom, right? Like we got Windows XP, we're like, we just moved up from Windows NT last year. <laughs> and we're like, all right. And I tell you what Marines do, they spend half their time online, and it's not for good stuff. <laughs> right? Audience, we don't pay enough attention to this. Maybe not so much on the enterprise and, or um, not so much on the enterprise side or um, large organizations, uh, where they just kind of have a website because they need to have a website. That's not necessarily how they sell. It's just, it's an expectation, you know. Uh, but think about like the mid market. Think about the consumers, the people, the bloggers or the website owners that are pushing out a website or maybe a large commerce site that depends on their audience. Think of an NBC, a media site. That audience is valuable. The web is a distribution mechanism. It's no longer me having to go around with a USB stick and drop it. Did you know, fun fact, um, if you were to drop a USB stick in a parking lot and put a logo on it, about 80% of the people would be like, uh, take it and plug it into the machine. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking, I wonder what jackass dropped that. Let's see what they got going on there. Did you know that? And what do most machines do? Autoplay, right? Use that, hijack the machine, I'm in the network. I didn't have to do shit. No reconnaissance required, I just go. <laughs> but, different story. Oh man, I digress. But on the audience side, think of your large customers that require that. Maybe you're a blogger, right? We have huge bloggers out there that generate a lot of traffic. A lot of them use WordPress, some of them use Drupal, right? Maybe your customer is an e-commerce site, they depend on audience. As an attacker, if I can manipulate that and affect your millions of users and distribute my payloads, my malware, whether it's SEO spam or not, it's valuable for me. Resources. A lot of people don't think of resources. Some people think of malware, some people think of drive-by downloads, things like that. Some people think about penetrating into the network. But what about becoming part of the larger security network, part of a larger botnet? What we see a lot is, once a website is attacked and we see the payload get dropped, not only do we see things like backdoors, but we see things like server level scripts for integrating them into larger CNC networks or CNC like command and control networks. So part of a 10,000 botnet environment used to attack other sites. So remember that story I was telling you about DDoS and attacking availability? Who do you think attacks those sites? Part of that botnet. And they have the ability to scale up and down at will. So they can start off with 100 sites and it just sits idle. Once somebody pays, they can ramp up to 10,000 servers infected. In fact, the, uh, the servers that we see attacking our customers and our network are often coming from environments that have compromised desktops and servers that they themselves may not even know that they have. And they, a lot of them come from educational institutions and government institutions. But that's another conversation. Who has kids here? Anybody, uh, kids like between 10 and 16? <coughs> yeah, they're probably in this group. 
right? Because most of you are here at conferences. Most of us are working. Most of us are doing things. I have a 10-year-old, right? And I have all these settings on the router, and I can see him. I walk by, and that little bugger is sitting there like this, looking at the network. I'm like, what, what are you doing there? I'm trying to get by because I have control where he can't go to certain sites. I mean, that's kind of fun, right? But still, that's what's happening. They're curious. They're born in an age where they're always interconnected. They're always trying to beat systems. They're playing video games. The video game tells them, you can't do this. Oh, yeah, I can't do this? Watch this. They're online talking to their friends, figuring out. They're building this breaker mentality, right? Some of these guys just, oh, just for the fun of it. Then you have um, the folks doing like defacements and stuff like that. Just, oh, why not? You know, it, they were using a vulnerable version. Ha ha, I'm gonna show these guys, right? Or maybe I'm doing it on a coffee break. Like, oh, look, that's interesting. Let me just try it out real quick. So what do they do, right? The first thing I like to tell folks is that security, at least when it comes to compromises, is kind of like an iceberg, right? What you see is but a fraction of the issue, right? Maybe 10, 20%. Okay, oh, I'm distributing malware. That's amazing. Congratulations, right? You remove it. But you need to extend beyond that and start looking at the rest of the iceberg. What else did they do? How are they sustaining access to the environment? Because most of them will. What manipulations, configuration changes did they make? Did they install anything that they shouldn't have? When we do that, I break it into seven distinct um, infection types that I feel to be kind of the most relevant today. Um, there's others, of course, but these are the ones that I want you to focus on. Anybody need a bio break or, or you guys good? Okay. Uh, so we have malware distribution, which, which, we, which we have discussed. Uh, we have search engine poisoning, which we briefly discussed, which is the act of um, manipulating things or targeting things like search engine result pages on Google, Bing, Yahoo, right? The ability to kind of uh, abuse that audience. We have phishing lures. Phishing lures is something you probably a lot get a lot of training on, right? Don't click on the link to get any emails. But the reason that that happens is because they're highly, highly effective. That's the easiest way to get into a network. Get a list of all the emails in that organization, send them a blast, via some compromised site, maybe one of yours, maybe not, that says, hey, I need you to log in to give me your credentials. And most people just simply click, put their information in, and they're like, oh, sweet, cool, thanks. Then they get to the office, they try to log in, it's like, I don't know, I thought I changed this. None the wiser. Spam email. This is happening more and more. Spam email is a little bit complicated because it can be abusing the mail servers on the servers, it can be abusing the forms on the page, improper function definition. Um, it could be abusing, um, it could be a mailer script on the server itself. Defacement, DDoS, and ransomware. Ransomware is probably something that we've all been talking about a lot in the security space. So just a little bit more information on these. So on the malware distribution side, you have things like drive-by <coughs> downloads. Uh, again, the focus there are, are the endpoints, right? Hey, who's visiting this site? What can I do in that site? Maybe I can download a financial trojan. Maybe I can steal some information. Uh, the motivation is being around revenue and audience. Search engine poisoning, being more like pharma hacks. Uh, we see a lot of casino hacks as well. We see a lot of uh, SEO spam, um, uh, not SEO spam, but uh, we saw a really interesting one where people were advertising um, essays, uh, school essays. So you can go to these sites and they'll, they'll write your essays for school. Maybe you have a class assignment. I guess that's a big thing. Um, fishing wars, like I mentioned a minute ago, the ability to penetrate other environments, steal information, right? get people to click on it, get their information, maybe it's for their social accounts, but maybe if I'm targeting an enterprise, I'm trying to penetrate that environment and that's how I do it. Defacements, a lot of hacktivism, you know, support the Turkish cause, right? Yay, ISIS, stuff like that. DDoS, Postgres, integrated into a larger network, sustaining access to that environment. Ransomware, so ransomware is a little bit interesting, right? We just, who's heard of the ransomware issues that hospitals have been having lately? Right? It's a big issue. Again, why are they having that issue? If they would have just updated their environment, it wouldn't have this issue, right? Again, an example of the exhaustion and the challenges that we have, not just within the application, but within the ecosystem as a whole. They haven't upgraded their environment, not because they don't want to, but because it's challenging. A lot of the critical infrastructure, think life support systems, are built on those old OSs and nobody's upgraded them. So they can't just go and upgrade it. But the web is a distribution mechanism. Guess what they do at hospitals? The same that you do at home. They check their emails. They go to social accounts. They click on links. 
That's an easy way to penetrate perimeters, download information, and our websites are part of that process. So they use the websites to distribute ransomware. They take it, they download a Trojan in the environment, they then encrypt the environment. Now they have to pay something to get access. But it's just not the environment. The other thing we've started to see is ransomware on websites themselves. I penetrate your environment. Similar to DDoS, my intent is to reduce availability. When I compromise your environment and I encrypt that with ransomware, it's so you can't access your information. A lot of people will say, that's fine, I have backups. Well, guess what? A lot of people don't have backups. Very difficult to comprehend, I know, but it's true. Even large organizations. What's the other challenge we have with backups? I get all the time, oh, I have a backup. Yeah, cool. Can we test it? Go to test it? Oh, shit. It hasn't worked for eight months. Something to think about. We have things like uh, ransomware, like I said, data exfiltration. Obviously, the most uh, relevant, uh, the, the one that we're probably the most aware of is data exfiltration. We saw it with Panama Papers with about 2.2 terabytes of information stolen. If we have an e-commerce site, we, we've been drilled in our heads with PCI, the importance of data exfiltration, stealing credit card information. If we're in health, we, we're familiar with HIPAA and the responsibility of in, in ensuring the, the storage of our customers' information. Which of our applications support that, right? And what are we doing, right? If we're building an application for a health institution and we're responsible for managing that, how are we doing that? What kind of encryption are we employing? Are we using things like HTTPS? On that note, let's remember that deploying HTTPS doesn't secure your site. It secures the communication between point A and point B, or in other words, data in transit. So in other words, if I push a payload from the browser to your web server over HTTPS, guess what? Now I've just, I've just pushed an encrypted version of that payload. If your website is infected and it's distributing malware and you're using HTTPS, guess what? Now you have securely distributed malware, <laughs> right? That's all it's doing. I think that's very, very important because I have more and more conversations, especially with business owners that say, but I deployed HTTPS. I am safe. I was like, no, no, no. Sit down, let's have a conversation. The impacts of this, right? <coughs> Why do I care? I get this a lot. Well, I've never been hacked, what do I care, etc. I break this out into two distinct groups. You have the business impacts, regardless of the type of organization you have, um, and then you have the technical impacts, right? On the, in, on the business side, you have the brand reputation. Maybe as a government, I really could care less. Like, meh, whatever. But if you're a commerce site, if you're a for-profit organization, shit, if you're an NGO, right? You're gonna care about your brand. You depend on people coming to your brand and feeling safe and secure and ensuring that they can get the information that they require, whatever that information may be. You have the economic impacts. If you get infected, especially if you're not a large organization and you don't have the systems in place, you can find yourself spending a lot of money trying to figure that out. Not just in terms of paying somebody to clean it up for you, but also in terms of um, the knowledge that you have to gain, the time that you have to invest to figure this process out because we didn't take a little bit of a proactive step. And we cannot undervalue the emotional distress. I cannot tell you the number of organizations that I've talked to where one, they were crying, I'm gonna get fired, right? And in some instances, we've seen a lot of CEOs get fired for it. Um, and in another instance, uh, just not understanding what's happening, especially you think mid-market. Right? Think of a business owner that hired you to develop something. Maybe they paid whatever to get the site up and running. They get compromised. They spent all this money. They're going to the developers and say, hey, why did you let this happen? And the developers are like, are you freaking kidding me? I let absolutely nothing happen. Right? Um, or you go to the host. Why are you doing something about this? It's not my responsibility. Look at the terms. It's your responsibility. You're the own end user. You're the owner. Right? And you go through kind of these phases, anxiety, Right, confusion, anger, sadness, distrust. I've, all the customers I've ever worked with, we have about 40,000 customers have experienced something like this that I've talked to personally on the phone, okay? On the technical side, we have things like website blacklisting. Blacklisting extends beyond things like Google. The other thing that gets blacklisted is the domain itself. Imagine nobody gets your emails anymore. It happens a lot, right? You have antiviruses that will blacklist you. you have network firewalls like web sensors of the world that will blacklist your environment. Once you get on one blacklist, you then have to find and traverse all the different environments. Okay, we have search blacklist, 
We have AV blacklist. We have MX blacklists. And you go through that process, like, why is nobody responding to me? Why is nobody clicking on my links? Because <laughs> they're not getting it. Then you have the SEO impact. This might be not of value to a lot of folks, but for some folks it is, especially in the mid-market that depend on content marketing and stuff like that, right? Getting that information out, maybe somebody's hijacking your SEO rankings, they're, they're abusing that information, maybe they're using that to distribute malware, things like that. Then of course, it's the actual visitor compromise itself. Your audience, people coming to it and thinking about, hey, um, why do I no longer have any money in my account? Oh, because I visited the site, there was a Trojan and I stole all my finances. Very simple co concept to understand. So how do we think about security? Um, I'll keep this as brief as possible. We have to remember that it's not a static state. It's a continuous process, right? Security has been around since day one, since there was first code, since the 90s, right? We gotta think about, hey, how do we maintain and stay ahead of these emerging threats? And it's impractical to think that one person or one organization that doesn't focus on it can keep up with it. I like to break it out into these five distinct groups, right? We gotta think about how we protect the environment, how we detect, the, how we detect potential issues, because we know protection is never 100%. And then of course, how do we respond, respond in the event that there is an incident? For the mid-market to slower market, the consumer market, I always like to introduce things like basic maintenance concepts, like virtual management, uh, patch, um, patching management, uh, upgrade management, things like that. I also like to talk about best practices, things like defense in depth, or things like least privileged. Basic concepts that a lot of people in security and even in the enterprise and large organizations understand, but in the mid-market to consumer market, not so much. I also like to emphasize that technology is not the easy button, right? Too often we say, hey, um, what should I deploy? What, what modules should I deploy in my environment? What should I configure? And it's this mindset of a checklist. Oh, well, if I have this module, I'm set. It's kind of like when they say, you know, you look at PCI and they're like, you must have a firewall. So you've got a firewall and you put it in your network and you're like, I have a firewall, I am not secure. I was like, no buddy, you are compliant. You're absolutely not secure. <laughs> it's, a, it's a three part process, right? You got people, process, and technology. Technology without the people is completely dumb, right? You buy it out of the box, you plug it in, it does absolutely nothing for you. Now you have a fancy device that filters all your traffic. The people have to go in and configure it. They have to configure it based on the environment. Hey, I have this kind of traffic, I have these kind of applications, I have these kind of things occurring in my environment, this is what I want. And then you have a process, like, hey, how do I keep up with the threats as they're emerging? Because it's usually a static state, so you have to continue to go through. Does this technology satisfy what I'm looking for, right? It's a mindset. I like to tell folks that security is not a DIY project. Obviously, I'm biased, because I have a security company, and that's what I do, right? <laughs> but it's not, and I think a lot of people find out the hard way that it's not. Uh, with that being said, let me tell you all the technologies that are available to configure your site from a security standpoint for Drupal modules. Just to give you an idea of how complex it is. This is the stuff that's recommended for a Drupal instance right now. And if you look, every one of them address a little bit different stuff. This is just security. How do you address this for marketing, sales, right? Any other functional unit that's trying to use this application. And you're gonna to go to your customer and you're gonna say, hey, check this out, I just deployed this thing, you're gonna need these 20 modules to ensure you're safe. Uh, my recommendation is we're looking at things like cloud-based technologies, where, where concepts like website application firewalls, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems need to be something that we're thinking about, right? How do we stay ahead of these attacks? How do we look at these attacks? How do we know that we have a problem? What are we gonna do if we do get compromised? So with that, oh, one thing I want to say is log aggregation and retention. I cannot stress the importance of this. Too often the organizations we work with have absolutely nothing enabled. Either the host has no logging, they have no logging. So it's impossible to understand what happened. We cannot do it through osmosis, right? We can see the issue, but we won't be able to know for sure if it was mitigated or not. And you as an organization would want to know this. You want to know how it happened. Not because anybody wants to come down on you, but because we want to make sure that that vector gets closed down. And then we'll move on from there. Like, okay, what else do we need to look at? So with that, I open it for Q&As. Um, that will be issued lunch. Any questions?
You are standing between people on lunch. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's, it's not exactly a question. Um, great information here. Um, I'm a maintainer of a bunch of security related modules, including key and encrypt. And um, for those who are interested in continuing the conversation, um, specifically about your plate security and encryption, I'll be doing them off at 345. Oh, cool. I have yours down to go to, actually. Yeah. Could bring a bit about the debate between password complexity versus frequency of password changes. I wonder if you weigh in that your opinion on which, which is a better strategy, more frequent password changes or less frequent but more complex passwords. This, this is like arguing a religion, right? Um, I, I am personally a fan of complexity over frequency, right? Most people don't understand the concept of password managers as much as you may breathe it down their throats. I like random generation. I don't, I have about 600 accounts that I have passwords through. I know one password, right? I don't like the idea of encouraging people to use phrases or, 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 or you know, adding characters and stuff like that because they still know it. And you get into this habit of habitual use of that same password. Ah, I'm just gonna create this social account really quick. Oh, I'm just going to log into my account with this really quick. Before you know it, all your accounts are using the same thing. Um, the, there was a good talk at SANS Network Security about three years ago in which they talked about the frequency of passwords, uh, password changes. And in that, they talked about a lot of people use like this three-month configuration, every three months, every six months, things like that. And they were saying that it's actually very antiquated. And that was based on a time where technology itself wasn't where it is today. The, the computing power isn't what it is today. And so at that time, it would actually take about three months to crack some complex environment. This was before we were talking about randomly generated stuff, before we had technologies to facilitate that, like password managers. You know, this was you know, 10, 15 years ago, right? The problem is that, like most things, that stays. Well, it's part of my process. You know, how, how, how hard is it to update controls? How hard is it to update compliance requirements, right? DISA, for crying out loud, right? It's still telling us to do crazy stuff from the 70s, you know? So it's like, you know, it's, it's one of those things that just hasn't caught up. I think with time, we're gonna realize that uh, changing things out on a continuous basis actually makes the process a lot harder. Um, most website owners, or most users, just don't operate like that. So my preference is specifically complexity. Uh, and I, I'm always looking at you know 20, 30 plus complexity because it really doesn't matter because I'm not going to know it. When people start putting controls in like 15, 16, 20, you're still putting it within the realm of uh, possibility that they'll remember it. You know what I mean? Um, so that's just my pre preference. What's up, bud? Um, two things. First, at the beginning of. I'm only taking one question at a time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, at the beginning, of your talk, you mentioned the panel. Yeah. What does the security community kind of think Google's role was in that incident? I personally think there was no role in it. Um, now, that being said, 2.2 terabytes of data was stolen, right? Some of that was client information that could potentially have come from the client portal. I don't know, right? All the information that came out was there was an email server compromise, uh, and some of the scans are showing it was a complex network, things like that. They had it in a different hosting environment. I like, you know, once you breach a perimeter, it's pretty complex from there. It's really, really hard. I, it feels very targeted. It feels like an internal attack. I know that they're saying that it's not, but if I was them, I would say the same exact thing. Of course, my people are not at fault. Like, everybody loves us. But when you look at the manifesto that we just went out, uh, the level of hate that they have for that, of all the organizations that could have targeted, they targeted them, intimate knowledge of what they were doing. I don't know. I, I think Drupal's impact on that was very low, but what do I know? I, it's very speculative until I know more. So we don't think that it was some sort of just massive scam or phishing exploit against Okay, you know? let's think about that for a second. So massive scans in the automation, the way I talked, happen at scale. So I have a server that's going through and scanning things, and it's reporting back, and then it triggers the next piece that just automatically exploits. That means that somebody's there monitoring the millions of websites coming through their server and saying, here's some random site, Moseka, or whatever, of course they're a shell company for this. <sighs> let me exploit them. Or they're saying, wow, this site just gave me 2.2 terabytes. Let me just go through this and figure out what that's about. Yeah, that didn't come from mass scanning. Okay. That's my personal opinion. That makes us all feel a little better in the room. No, the, the only reason I bring that up is because that's an example of what it looks like in the real world. I'm not saying that it was a vector for that. What I'm saying is that that's the challenge. 
Those are your users. That, that's where it says six point adoption from the time of release is really, really low. How do we fix that? How do we close that gap? How do we get people to leverage the latest controls that are implemented in Drupal 8? Um, my second question was related to the large um, critical goals that we had for the Drupal community about a year and a half ago. Yeah. 7.32 release. Mm -hmm. um, I saw one payload of that exploit come in. Did anybody else in the room see any um, or give an example of the payload? Yeah, we do actually have a few in our network that we saw come through, and I thought we reported on it. Um, I'll talk back to my partner, Daniel, to see if we can get something out and share it of other exploit attempts that occurred. It helps us to know what to look for. Yeah, for sure. If for we sure. see the bulk, that's great, but to know actually an example of payload. Yeah, no, for sure. We actually just did one um, this week for Image Tragic. We, the minute we started seeing that come through our network and what they were doing with that, um, so I'll go back and look. I think we reported on it and shared something, but I'll confirm, and I'll talk to my partner and see if he's got something in his net, in a, in a very large network, right? So we'll just see what we can post some logs, and if anything's still happening. Thanks, Tony. Hey, can we get your, if I get your info, I'll make sure I follow up with you and send it to you. I'll stop all that. Cool. Any other questions? Was I lying about anything? Am I full of shit? <laughs> I'm cool with that. I got thick skin, brother. All right, cool. Then with that, I think we'll break for lunch. Thank you guys so much for your time.